Okay, I'll go through some revision of this slide. Uh, this was the structure of the titanate, the lead titanate, and we had a tetragonal cell here, which means that the lattice parameters are equal on the basal plane, and this is a longer axis, with uh, lead atoms at not exactly the corners, but slightly mm -hmm. higher than the corners. Mm -hmm. So um, the Z coordinate is about 0.116. Titanium atom also not exactly at the half position, but above the half plane. And oxygen atoms located exactly on the face centers. And the point group of mm -hmm. this, you know, obviously mm -hmm. if it's tetragonal, mm -hmm. then we must have a fourfold axis, a single fourfold axis. And there are two mirror planes which are parallel to the fourfold axis, uh, basically parallel to this face and this face passing through the center. So the point group is 4 mm, and this is a primitive cell. Uh, the purpose of doing this exercise was that if you know the symmetry of your cell, and you locate an atom at an arbitrary position, then when you operate by this point group, so a fourfold axis will produce this, this, and this, and the two mirror planes will produce the pairs that you see over there. So if you locate an atom at an arbitrary position, there must be eight atoms inside the unit cell. Um, if you locate it on the mirror plane itself, then there are only four. And if you locate on the mirror plane, but um, this this particular position, then you will only have one inside the unit cell. Okay, so the point group symmetry tables that you have here tell you how many atoms to expect in the unit cell depending on the position of that atom in the cell. And point groups ignore any translational symmetry because the translations involved are very small. And when you look at a macroscopic crystal, you don't see the very small translations. So I'm going to today introduce you to space groups, which are point groups, including translations. So there's many more space groups than point groups. So obviously those translations have consequences on the properties of the material but you can't see them if you're just looking at the macroscopic shape of the crystal because the translations are a fraction of the repeat distance, yeah, like half the repeat distance or a quarter of the repeat distance. Okay, so these do not involve any translations. These are rotation axes and uh, these are operations which combine a rotation with an inversion through the center. If I add translations to rotation axes, then I get what's known as screw axis. So 2, 1 refers to a rotation of 180 degrees and a translation of half the repeat distance. Okay? So 1 divided by 2 of the repeat distance between uh, the lattice points or, and so on. Um, this is a rotation of 120 degrees and a translation of one third along the axis. Uh, translation of two-thirds along the axis and similarly we have tetrads uh, or screw tetrads. A glide plane, so in this case the translations are all parallel to the axis, so it's operating like a screw. Yeah. If you have a mirror plane, so this is now a plane, it's no longer uh, an axis, I have an object here I will generate another object. Uh, let me start with an object on this side. I'll generate another object on this side. And then you have translations parallel to the mirror plane to reproduce the element. Okay. So there's a reflection followed by a translation which is parallel to the mirror plane. And that translation can be this way plus this way. Okay. That would be a diagonal glide. Right. So let me illustrate that. Yeah, so this is uh, now uh, an illustration of the fourfold screw axes. Uh, this is uh, four with a subscript three. So this is a normal rotation axis. If I turn by 90 degrees, I recover this point here. And this is the repeat distance along that axis. Okay. 
So a 4-1 operation means I rotate this point uh, or this point by 90 degrees, okay? but I don't recover anything over here because I have to do a translation by a quarter of the repeat distance. Yeah? From here to here is a quarter of the repeat distance. Is everyone happy with that? Uh, in this case, I rotate by 90 degrees and translate by half the repeat distance, 2 divided by 4 of the repeat distance. Rotate by 90 degrees and translate by 3 quarters of the distance and you recover, sorry, rotate by 90 degrees and translate by um, 1, 2, 3 to recover the original position. Okay? So these are screw axes and involve translations parallel to the rotation. Now, in the case of glide planes, uh, an axial glide plane, uh, which is identified by a symbol A, B, or C, is simply a translation by half the repeat distance parallel to the mirror plane. Okay. A diagonal glide plane, which is identified by the symbol N, uh, as opposed to M for mirror, is a translation half this way and half this way, and therefore you are doing a diagonal glide. A diamond glide will involve translations of a quarter, and in the case of a body-centered cubic uh, structure, we can have a diamond glide involving three translations, A, B, and C. Okay. So, again, this is not something for you to remember. This is all in your notes, and we are not doing a memory exercise here. You just need to understand what we are doing. So, I'm going to deal with a crystal which shows all of these, uh, not all of these operations, but some of these operations. So, these are glide planes which involve a reflection followed by a translation. Right, so this is uh, copper oxide, Cu2O, so two copper atoms and one oxygen atom in the molecule. Can you tell me what kind of a lattice type this would be, just by looking at this? Hmm? Um, Sorry? Say it louder. Go on, don't worry. No, no. No. Um, look, look at this shape. Hmm? Yeah. Fourfold and... Yeah. See, are, are these one, one, one planes here? Yeah, body diagonal planes. So it's what? Cubic. Yeah. So by looking at the shape of this crystal, uh, you can immediately tell it should be cubic. Okay. The symmetry uh, tells you that it's cubic. Of course, you know, normally you would measure angles, everything, uh, whereas you are just looking at an image, so it's okay to get it wrong, yeah? Okay, so this is copper oxide, Cu2O, and we know from the shape that it's cubic. Um, which is the copper atom and which is the oxygen atom? Hmm? Yeah, right. Uh, just by counting how many atoms we have in the cell, right? Okay. So, um, this is um, one, and then you add up the corner atoms, that's two, and these are four, and therefore the white has to be copper because it's Cu2O. What is the lattice type?
So it's cubic, so it can be either primitive or body centered or face centered. Sorry? Don't worry, just say it loud. You have one third probability of being right <laughs> if, if it is random. Okay. Primitive. Um, because the environment of this atom is not the same as this atom, and similarly, the environment of this, where you know this is pointing in this direction, is not the same as the environment of this, and so on. So each one of those cannot be a lattice point. There's only lattice points at the corner. So this is a primitive cell, and you know it, it's actually quite difficult because it's a three-dimensional diagram and I don't recommend three-dimensional diagrams so I'm going to show you now a structure projection and there it will become very clear that it's a primitive cell. So here uh, are four of those structure projections. Uh, it's always good to draw four because then you can see the environment more clearly. Right? Um, okay, so this one is located at a height half and half along here and half along here. These are at 0 and 1 and these are pointing upwards and these oxygen atoms are pointing downwards. Uh, sorry, copper atoms are pointing downwards, right? So clearly the environment of this is not the same as this. Yeah, because here we are going downwards, here we are going upwards in that bond. Okay? And similarly the environment of this uh, uh, where we have two um, copper atoms pointing upwards is not the same as the environment of the one located at one where it's pointing downwards. Okay? So it is clearly a primitive cell and the motif consists of um, six atoms which you place at every single lattice point and the coordinates of those six atoms are copper atoms at quarter, quarter, three quarters, quarter, quarter, three quarters, whoops, uh, sorry, that's minus a quarter, minus quarter, three quarters, and quarter, minus quarter, quarter, uh, and so on, and oxygen atom at the corner and at the body center. Okay? So we're placing a motif of six atoms at every single lattice point to generate our structure. Now, can you see that there is a 4-2 axis over here pointing out of the plane of the board. So that means a 4-2 means a rotation of 90 degrees and a translation parallel to the axis by half the repeat distance. Can you see that? So just stare at the diagram and think about what happens to let's say this particular atom if you rotate by 90 degrees If, I, if you rotate by 90 degrees, you'll end up with an atom here at a height half, which is not correct. Yeah, because here the atoms are only at 0 and 1. But if you then do a translation by plus or minus half, then you recover. Okay? So this is a, a screw axis, which involves a rotation of 90 degrees, followed by a translation of a half parallel to that axis. And of course, this should work for every single atom. So, can you, what will happen to this when you rotate by 90 degrees? You'll end up with one here, but at a height quarter. And therefore, if you add a translation of half, you've recovered the one at three quarters. Okay? So, that's a screw axis. Right, now, I'd like you to uh, so, when we are doing our point group notation or space group notation, uh, we start with looking at symmetry elements which are parallel to the z-axis. Okay? So, can you see whether there's a mirror plane or, or a glide plane which is parallel to the z-axis? Okay? So, this is quite difficult, right? but let's see if some of you have a good imagination and tell me where there is a glide plane. Glide plane or mirror plane? 
Right. Mirror plane means no translations. Okay, just look for a mirror plane first. Is there any mirror plane? Yeah, uh, go, going this way, right? Yeah, that, that's perfectly correct. Uh, along the 110. Uh, so quarter reflects to quarter. Um, this one at 0 and 1 reflects to 0 and 1, and so on. Okay, so there are mirror planes on the 110 planes. Okay, so this is our structure, and I claim that is a glide plane. Okay. And it's an N glide plane. That means there's a reflection plus a single translation by half the repeat distance. So again, imagine what happens to this atom at a height half. If I reflect it over here, you end up with an atom at a height half, which is not, not correct. So if I now translate by a half this way, it's still not correct because it's at the height half and I go upwards by a half, then I recover. So that's a diagonal glide, not a single translation as I said first. Uh, you reflect, translate by a half and half upwards and you've got an N glide. Yeah. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. And that is parallel to the Z-axis. So we'll add the symbol N for N glide. If we convert this into a point group, that would be PM, because, you know, in point groups there are no translations. Okay. Now, if I, so is everybody clear about the meaning of a glide plane? Yeah. Uh, I did that for the atom located at a half, but supposing I did it for the one at a quarter. Um, if I reflect it. Yeah. If I reflect it, then I end up with, where do I, this distance, yeah, I end up with that, right? No? No, because this distance, uh, this is a quarter, this is a quarter, and this is a half. Okay, let's say we end up here. If I translate by half this way and half this way, I recover this position. Okay. So it should work for every single atom, that when you do the glide operation, you should end up with an atom at that position. Okay. Right, everyone happy with that? Okay, so we've generated part of the uh, symmetry of this crystal and the reason why we are doing this is we want to again demonstrate that if you put an atom at a particular location you should generate an equivalent number of positions. We don't know how many those positions are until we complete this exercise. So the purpose is to solve the structure by using the symmetry of the cell. So now I want to look at uh, symmetry elements which are differently located. So Given that this is a cubic crystal, okay, oops, you know, uh, this is like looking at the body diagonal, right? So clearly we must have uh, threefold axes, okay, uh, four, four triads. So the second symbol becomes uh, easy. After PN, we must have a three. Okay, now, um, to show you that the crystal has a center of symmetry, uh, it's a bit difficult with the cell that I've drawn, this cell. You know, if I invert through the center and so on, it's quite difficult to see. So what I'm going to do is identify another cell which has origins at the copper atom instead of the oxygen atom. And then it becomes very, very clear that the crystal has a center of symmetry. So remember that you can choose any unit cell that you like, right? It doesn't have to be the one that was uh, that's drawn over here. 
I'm just going to change the origin from the oxygen atom to the copper atom. Okay, so I'm identifying this now as the cell with origin at the copper atom. And you should be able to see that there is a center of symmetry at a height three quarters. So that is located at a height three quarters. So if I take an atom here, which is at a height half, I pass through three quarters, then I end up with something at one. And you know you can do the same thing: three quarters, three quarters, three quarters. Yeah. Uh, and this is at a quarter. If I pass it through three quarters, then I end up with something which is. Uh, so if I if you go from quarter to three quarters plus a half is a quarter. Yeah. Okay. So there's a center of symmetry located at a height three quarters. And I'm going to draw now the three dimensional cell, which shows this even more clearly that there is a center of symmetry. Yeah. So this is the same cell, but with the origin at the copper atom. And you can see that there is a center of symmetry there, okay? You know, you reflect the tetrahedron onto the other side. So, to indicate that, we have a center of symmetry. Uh, we have these uh, four triads and we have mirror planes along the 110 axis. Yeah. We have Pn, now bar 3 gives you that center of symmetry. And M is the mirror plane, which is the third symbol. So we've chosen the symbol parallel to uh, the 100, 111, and 110, respectively. And this is now our space group as opposed to point group because N includes the translation. Okay? We don't need to specify that we have a screw axis. The screw axis comes automatically by using this minimum set. Okay? Everyone happy? Okay, so we've got this set of operations and we now examine what would happen if we place an atom at an arbitrary position or at a particular location uh, where there is a, a lot of symmetry. And remember that all these calculations have been done and are available as tables in the standard crystallographic uh, tables. They're, so they're called the standard crystallographic tables. So there are something like 232 space groups. And people have worked out the number of atoms in each one of those, depending on where you place. So it's, all that work has been done for you. Okay? Okay, so if you look at the threefold axis, which is the body diagonal, then there's also a mirror plane parallel to that body diagonal because that's a 110 plane and you know you can have a 111 direction lying inside a 110 plane so any atom uh, that lies on the body diagonal here has a threefold axis passing through it and a mirror plane so the point group symmetry of that will be bar 3m because we also have a center of symmetry so, can you tell me that if I, if I put an atom here, how many more atoms must I have at equivalent positions? So, if I place an atom at bar 3m, how many more should I expect in the cell? So, don't think too hard. It will be very easy to answer. Yeah? Three more. Yeah? Because, you're right, because, oh, uh, so, so you've got the right answer, yeah, but the wrong reason. Uh, so, at the moment I don't have these atoms, I've just placed one single atom at bar 3m. How do I know that these should also exist? So I've only got one single copper atom in the cell at the moment, which I've placed at a location which has a point symmetry bar 3m. Yeah. 
So in all of these things, you shouldn't think too hard, all right? You know, just think you've got a, an atom located on a bar three. How many threefold axes do you have in a cube? Four, okay? So if you place an atom there, you expect another three. Okay, is that clear to everyone? An atom lying on that threefold axis, there must obviously be three more atoms because there are four threefold axes, the body diagonals in the cell. Okay? And of course, if it's a threefold axis, then yes, you are right. There's a rotation symmetry which demands that if I place an atom here, there'll be another one here and here. But in the first instance, when you're just placing one atom, you need to indicate, you know, where, how many more atoms I'm likely to have in the cell of, at equivalent positions, okay? So don't worry about asking questions if you have some, all right? So in, in this cell, we will have four uh, copper atoms because the place where the copper atom is located has the point group bar 3m. And of course, uh, the mirror plane is not generating further atoms because the atom is actually located on the mirror plane. Okay? So if I've got an atom on the mirror plane, then it's not being reflected, basically, right? It's only the three that is doing, uh, generating the extra atoms. Okay, um, so the oxygen atom has a fourfold axis passing through it. Yeah. Whether it's located here or here, uh, a fourfold axis. And uh, if it's located at the corner, then you also have the body diagonal passing through it. And the mirror plane is at 110. So, how many, uh, how many atoms have this combination of symmetry elements? Well, obviously, the one at the corner has a fourfold axis passing out of the plane of the board. There's a mirror plane at the 110, uh, and there's a threefold axis passing through the body diagonal, right? The same applies to this, okay? Therefore, we end up with two of these atoms inside the unit cell. Okay, so uh, I explained to you that all these uh, calculations have been done. So for the space group that we have, which is Pn bar 3 m, there's a long table, and I've summarized this table, okay? But I think the longer version is in your notes. Uh, if I place an atom at an arbitrary position, x, y, z, and remember this is cube. So a cube has a huge amount of symmetry compared with the previous example we did, where we had uh, tetragonal symmetry. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we would end up with 48 atoms inside the unit cell. Uh, so given that you know the lattice parameters, it's not possible to have 48 atoms inside that cell. Okay, so that clearly would be the wrong thing to do, is to put an atom at an arbitrary x, y, z position. If you look at bar 3m, which is where the copper atoms are located, then there are only four equivalent positions. So if you place an atom at bar 3m, then you will end up with four of those atoms, and with this, you will end up with that. Okay, two atoms at not, 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 and half of half. If you placed uh, um, uh, an atom on a mirror plane, but at an arbitrary position on that mirror plane, uh, so we are not specifying you know, the values of x and z, then you would end up with 24 atoms. Okay? So you would get the wrong density, you would get the wrong formula as well for copper oxide because you've analyzed this material and you know that it's Cu2O. So you need to compare with density and with the chemical formula and so on, to actually determine the structure, okay? So we've done two examples. Uh, one was the tetragonal structure, and there, you know, 
only point groups were relevant to determine the positions of the atoms and the number of equivalent positions. Here we had the additional complication that there is also translational symmetry, uh, which is not trivial. In other words, you know, if you just go from node to one, that's also translational symmetry, but what we mean is fractional translations. And again, the same thing works, that if you place the atom at a particular position, you need to think about how many equivalent positions there will be in the cell. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? So that finishes point groups and space groups. Um, can I just uh, open the next page, I think? Yeah, so on page 41, for the same structure, you have the complete table for that space group, which is Pn bar 3m. So there are all these tables exist. And you can just look at them on the internet or go to the library reference books and they will be there. Okay, okay now I mentioned to you in the first lecture that in material science we are not just interested in single crystals. Okay? We are interested in polycrystalline materials and also when they are polycrystalline with different structures. And one of the main things that you are interested in is things like orientation relationships between a precipitate and a matrix and the shape of the precipitate, whether it's like a thin plate or a sphere or, or whatever. And symmetry can help you there as well. In particular, uh, when the precipitate forms under equilibrium conditions inside your matrix, you know, what determines its shape? Uh, it, you know, assuming there is no strain energy term, things like that, then it would be some kind of interfacial energy minimization, right? And interfacial energy is minimized if the precipitate and the matrix share some symmetry. Okay, so let me show you that. So, we are now talking about transformations which are not like martensite, right? Because in those transformations, the strain energy term is huge and it completely determines the shape. The precipitate then adopts a shape which minimizes strain energy. You know, the interfacial energy term is negligible compared with strain. Okay? So now I'm just talking about precipitates whose shape uh, it depends mostly on interfacial energy minimization and there's a lot of diffusion that happens during the transformation. Diffusion always relieves strains. Okay. Okay, so um, aluminium is face-centered cubic. Yeah, you all know that. And its uh, point group symmetry is a fourfold axis with a mirror plane normal to that fourfold axis. Uh, obviously, there are four triads and then a twofold axis with a mirror plane normal to that twofold axis. Okay? So, this is the symmetry element along the z axis and then along the x axis. And of course, we have the triads. And in aluminium silver alloys, uh, these are very strong alloys. You, know, you get a very complex set of precipitates forming very high density. And at one point, they were, they were proposed for some aircraft applications. You get a precipitate called omega, which has this point group symmetry. That means dyad with a mirror plane normal to that, and so on. So that's obviously an orthorhombic crystal. Okay? <coughs> and <coughs> when you measure the orientation relationship, the edges of the unit cell here are parallel to the close back direction in aluminium, uh, close back plane or direction, and the 101 close back direction in the aluminium. So, this is how you specify an orientation relationship. You find two directions in the precipitate which are parallel to two directions or planes in the matrix. Okay, you happy with that? Right, so let's see the consequence of this, bearing in mind that the symmetry is this and this. The precipitate will find a shape 
which is which represents the common symmetry between these two okay i'll show you that by showing you both the shape and an electron diffraction pattern okay so um just to show you that when you have the 2 2 2 we are in the orthorhombic system and here we are in the cubic system with the i forget what we had but aluminum is cubic you know that already right okay so in the precipitate this is a dyad and this is a triad in the precipitate this is a dyad because it's orthorhombic cell yeah and this is uh, uh, the dyad in the aluminium. So we need to just think about what are the common symmetry elements and clearly the dyads are common because even though this dyad is parallel to this fourfold axis you know we still have 180 degrees operation in a fourfold axis. And these are mirror planes in the orthorhombics. You can see these are heavy lines that I've drawn not, not thin lines and we also have common mirror planes between the two. Okay, so we've got a dyad and a mirror plane common. Okay. So, the precipitate has a shape of a thin plate exactly like I've drawn here. And you can see there's a dyad here and there's a mirror plane normal to the dyad. So the precipitate has adopted a shape which gives you common symmetry between the crystal structure of the precipitate and of the matrix. Okay. And if you look at the electron diffraction patterns, uh, super uh, they are arranged in the same order as the orientation relationship here. Then you can see that both of these have a dyad here. Okay. And both of these have a mirror plane here. Okay. So the orientation relationship is determined here by the need to share symmetry elements that are common to both. And similarly, the shape of the crystal is consistent with the common symmetry element between the precipitate and the matrix. So that's quite, quite an interesting result. You know, the first time we've dealt with uh, two crystals together, and they happen to be different lattice types. And when you look at the precipitate shape in the transmission electron microscope, it has the shape consistent with 2 upon m, yeah? a diet and a mirror plane normal to that diet. So next time you look at some orientation relationships in your own work, you can think like this, assuming that you know, the precipitate is dominated by interfacial energy rather than strain terms. Obviously, when the particle is very small, there'll be coherency strains. Yeah? in which case you're not able to use this argument. But when it grows to a certain size, its shape should adopt that which is consistent to both. Uh, there's a further, further problem, is that if you get heterogeneous nucleation, that means the precipitate forms on a dislocation or on a grain boundary, then there's, you know, this story doesn't hold because nucleation is determined by destroying that defect rather than uh, the shape of the crystal. Okay. Okay. So that's the end for today's lecture. And to be honest, you know, you have absorbed really quite difficult things. You know, the point group and space group without too much pain. So you're very good students. Okay. And I'll see you in the next lecture. <laughs>